but the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Yama. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I would like to share my screen here. Um, share. So I will check my presentation. Um, wait, sorry. Do you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, so I didn't really know about the audience of this uh, event. So, but I I will try to be somehow comprehensive. Twenty minutes is very limited, but I will go uh, straight forward um, to the presentation. So, um, I also didn't follow the, the 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 session this morning. But anyway, I can remind. Obviously, when we look at this kind of maps, the water risk uh, worldwide. So we see clearly that uh, the Middle East and North Africa, like MENA region including India and many parts in Asia are suffering from, you know, there is a, a, a extreme or to high high risk when it comes to water resources. Uh, and uh, we can say that two thirds of the world face water scarcity today. Uh, um, and we, if we look also at this uh, map or projection of water stress by 2040, we see clearly that the Middle East and North Africa and many areas in, in, uh, in Asia will suffer from uh, water scarcity. So we, we obviously with the climate change impact, with the population growth and the economic growth, all this will exacerbate water scarcity. And of course, that will make more pressure on water resources and we need to find the find solutions for this. Uh, there are some figures about some, uh, uh, especially in the, in the Arab region, we can see, for example, here that um, six to 14 percent of the projected GDP loss due to climate related to water scarcity in the Middle East and North Africa region by 2050. So we see also the economic impact of this situation. Um, so in general, when we talk about water scarcity, it's about balance between water supply and water demand. Uh, so in general, the, the, the obvious question we ask, do we have water? It is, is it available? Uh, it is accessible. Can I bring it to my field or to my whatever use? Uh, the cost, is it affordable? Sometimes we can have a water source, but it's too expensive to have it or to treat it or whatever. And the other question is the quality. So is the quality uh, available is uh, uh, enough or good for my use, either drinking or uh, irrigation or else. Uh, so what kind of actions in general? So when we have this situation, so uh, automatically we think about supply, uh, providing more water. Uh, this solution is one option, obviously. Uh, we can think about preserving, conserving the quality of the water we have. Uh, we can talk about increasing the water use efficiency and productivity. We know that in general, agriculture absorbing in many areas of the world, almost between 70 and 80% of the water resources and uh, 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 water use efficiency in agriculture is very low in many countries. We are talking sometimes about 30% to 40%. So there is a lot of effort to be done at this level. And then reviewing the demand management. So if, for example, in the Gulf countries, we have uh, the highest consumption per capita uh, of water uh, 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 in the world. So we need to do something at the level of demand to reduce the demand uh, and or manage the de demand better. So desalination, as I said, is one option of water supply. So it's not the only option. We can also have like treated wastewater and uh, water transfer, etc. So I will focus on desalination. So as already mentioned, I think this morning uh, that we have obviously uh, um, a lot of uh, salty water around the world from oceans, seas, and the brackish water. So this solution seems to be a good, a good option. Uh, right now we have almost, I think we are producing almost 100 million cubic meters per day, desalinated water. We have around 20,000 desal plants around the world. What is desalination? So obviously we already explained it. So we are uh, trying to desalinate uh, uh, saline water uh, to convert it to fresh water. And we can do this uh, separating, you know, uh, uh, do, uh, with the separation units depends on which kind of energy we use, whether mechanical or thermal or electric energy. And then we have fresh water from one side and we have what we call the brine or concentrate, which is a very salty water with including some, some chemicals. Um, uh, we, when it comes to distinguish between desalination technologies, so we, we, have also, uh, we can dis distinguish between them according to the processes, whether it, it, they are heat driving processes like MED, MSF, uh, humidification, dehumidification, or, or power driving processes, mainly like RO, FO, electrodialysis, uh, etc. So I will not get into detail. When we look at the markets worldwide, we see clearly that in the last decade, RO or even osmosis are dominating the market quite uh, uh, considerably. We're talking about 70% of the plants are RO, 
and the trend will even be uh, uh, higher in the next uh, upcoming years or decade. Uh, I show in the, 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 this right part of the slide uh, one challenge I launched two years ago, which we called Oman Humanitarian Destination Challenge. You can see the website here. So we talk in general about big plants, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 cubic meters per day production, but also some small destination devices or even individual destination device could be a solution for some cases like natural disaster, whenever we have a tsunami or earthquake or floods, sometimes people are struggling to survive and the emergency agencies or humanitarian agencies take time to intervene. So we can use such devices to deploy in such areas to make people survive. So we are offering, when I was working in Midrick in Oman, the last five years, we are offering, still the challenge is going on, $700,000 to whoever in the world can develop such a small or individual dissension device that could produce three liters per day of fresh water uh, and could uh, and the cost shouldn't be higher than $20 per unit. So to facilitate, you know, the, the, the distribution of such devices. So you can get more information in the website, distillationchallenge.com. Um, so the RO system, so RO is a dominating uh, technology in the market. The typical configuration is like that. So we have a pretreatment and we have the RO system. So we need high pressure pumps to push the water uh, toward the, the RO modules or RO membranes. And we uh, uh, have a post-treatment. Uh, so adjust the quality of the water according to the final use. And obviously we have the brine discharge. So this, we need to uh, find solution for this. And we have energy recovery devices to optimize the use of energy in the, in the, in the, in the process. Uh, obviously, as any other technology, we have advantage and we have limitations. I will not get into, into much details, but uh, why RO is dominating the market right now? Because it has more advantages than other technologies uh, like thermal distillation technologies. I think this map, someone showed, showed it already this morning. So the distribution of diesel plants around the world, we can see that almost half of the capacity is concentrated in the Middle East and North Africa. Already mentioned by my colleague, uh, Hiroshan, Saudi Arabia is the biggest producer of this salinity water with almost 15 million cubic meters per day, which is going to increase further with nine big diesel plants in the Red Sea shore in the upcoming years. So this is going to, to continue. And when we look at the, the, the cost, it's a very complex uh, question, but uh, for example, in UAE, what Hassian seawater arrow plant, they are talking about $0.3 per cubic meter, which is really, really very low. But I will talk about the economics later on. So uh, obviously when we compare the cost and right now with 30 or 40 years ago, there is no, you know, no comparison because we did really a very uh, uh, considerable improvement at the level of technology, at the level of ener energy consumption, especially, you know, uh, electricity. I mean, we are talking about uh, 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 now, uh, um, uh, RO is 3.5 kilowatt hour cubic, uh, uh, cubic meter, but uh, even we are trying to get closer to the thermodynamic limits. Uh, uh, I will show a slide about this. So is this a solution to ensure water security? We cannot say this only is a solution, it's part of the solution. So when we can adopt the integrated water resource management framework, as we need to look at everything, you know, so this is one important component of the, the solution. Uh, when we look at MENA region, for example, uh, whatever regional strategy, like the Arab water strategy, the Mediterranean water strategy, the five plus five water strategy, the essential component is there as part of the planning. As already mentioned by the students, so obviously it's still controversy in terms of environmental impact, uh, because still we are relying on fossil fuels to power those plants and it's still energy intensive. We did improvement, but it's still energy in intensive and uh, costly. And we need so to look for more uh, uh, environment friendly technologies uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so basically, uh, this nation as a sustainable solution, we need to solve out some problems. Uh, the main important problem are there are here. Energy consumption, we need to do an effort to reduce the consumption uh, in terms of energy. The cost, the capital and OPEX of the, of the, of the uh, I mean, the operation and the capital uh, cost of this engine plant or project. The fouling scaling, which is the main problem of the RO technology. So we have this uh, problem often, especially in some areas where we have a, a bad feed water quality. And the, for example, in the Gulf area, we have what we call harmful algae blooms, which also ha uh, happens in California and in Japan. So this, uh, when we have a high concentration of algae blooms, so, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the plants are suffering from this, especially the pretreatment. That's why we uh, we we are now using DAF system, but it's still not 100% efficient. And then environmental impact, which is energy consumption, carbon footprint, and obviously the brine at level of discharge, but also at the, the, in, the level of intake. 
Uh, when we talk about energy demand of this uh, for this uh, nation, so I say the average is 3.5 kilowatt hour per cubic meter, but we are going uh, even low, lower. We are reaching 2.2, and we are getting closer to the thermodynamic limit, which is around 1.3. Um, uh, renewable desalination now becoming an option. So when we when it comes to low or uh, low scale, I mean uh, remote areas or small uses for some villages, it's quite popular, quite competitive. I think uh, Elemental Company was presented this morning here, and there are many companies uh, providing or promoting such solutions, uh, which is are really uh, has a lot of advantage of business. So we we have it's uh, easily deployable, uh, uh, low cost in uh, in terms of maintenance. Uh, we have obviously two configurations, whether we have, we can rely on batteries the, during the night uh, times or whether we, we can connect to the grid. So once we don't have the solar radiation, solar power, we can rely on the, on the, on the grid. Um, so solar desalination definitely has a lot of advantages. So we reduce our all carbon footprint, we decrease the running costs, we eliminate the link between water prices and the, the, the fuel cost. Uh, so uh, we can see the different combinations of renewable desalination or solar desalination. So PVR oh, seems the most popular with 32% uh, 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 when it comes to the, 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 the oil plants around the world. And then we have uh, other combinations. We, we have like, for example, wind RO. In Australia, we have a Perth plant, which is a big plant powered by windmill uh, farm. So uh, uh, we have many uh, other you know, combinations. That's what is well. the PV, please? PVRO, reverse Sorry. osmosis? PV. Photovoltaic, sorry, photovoltaic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. And in terms of, uh, uh, of the MENA region, so we have many plants. Uh, you can see in Tunisia, in Qatar, in Algeria. In Al Khafji plant in Saudi Arabia is the biggest one powered by solar, which is like 60,000 cubic meters per day, which is uh, quite a big plant. Uh, but up to now, big plants rely on solar is quite complicated because in terms of the cost, in terms of deploying photovoltaic panels, and the cost is not that, uh, that obvious. But obviously, the advantages are there. Use, we are using free solar energy for operation. Uh, it is not that expensive uh, uh, now. It's become really competitive. It's easy to transport, light, light in weight. Uh, uh, the plants can be also set up easily, either onshore or offshore, low maintenance costs, and environment uh, friendly. Those are some examples you know, of projects that I witnessed uh, a long time ago, actually. This project, for example, by Spanish partners in 2003, 2008, uh, in Morocco, so we, uh, we were uh, uh, supplying some villages with fresh water using this uh, solar desalination uh, uh, units. In Tunisia, the same project were deployed in this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 15 years ago in Tunisia with successful results. Uh, so when we compare, you know, the solar versus conventional desalination cost, as I said before, so we are becoming really competitive, especially in the range of 500 to 5,000 cubic meters per day. So we are really getting uh, the cost uh, closer to the conventional water uh, resources. Uh, so also this is used for agriculture actually. In Spain, for example, in UAE, in Oman. So because of the seawater intrusion, because of the salinization of the soil and water, so we have to use this salination. And obviously in Oman, there was somehow subsidizes from the government to make it affordable for the farmers, uh, but they, ha they are improving. I think the, the best example is Spain. They are using it in an efficient way in the south of Spain, Almeria and Murcia. One option to reduce the cost of this salination for agriculture is to mix Desalinated water with less low quality groundwater and follow certain irrigation deficit schemes to irrigate high value crops. What happened, for example, in Oman, the farmers are, you know, they are using desalinated water, but for low value crops, you know. So uh, this is not good. So we need to, you know, to uh, to uh, use desalinated water because it's expensive for high value crops to find the, uh, to make it cost effective. Uh, so these are some photos I took myself in some farms in the north of Oman. So the desalination units are used, RO unit is used there. This is the evaporation pond that they use to deal with the brine. This is a very basic solution, not we you know the best solution, but uh, they can deal with it. Unfortunately, this example is not well done because the design of the evaporation pond should respect certain criteria. In this case, the guy puts in a deep evaporation pond without slope, and obviously this takes ages to evaporate. Um, so in terms of environmental impact, I need to I probably to hurry up. Uh, so we are talking about seawater intake, also the land use and the construction impact in the coastal areas, the carbon footprint or the, the, the brine. Uh, so the brine is a major uh, concern because we are talking about very salty water with uh, a lot of uh, noxious chemicals. Uh, so in general, the brine disposal, uh, I mean, respects a certain, uh, uh, depending on the country, on the regulation, how strict it is 
So the companies or the operators should, uh, you know, stick to. So the outfall with the fuels is designed to reduce salinity down to 10% of the ambient levels within 100 meters of discharge. So we need to respect this and to, uh, you know, dilute this uh, this brine and let, don't let it concentrate in one in one area to reduce the, the environmental impact. So the impact to the discharge. So we can talk about. Uh, discharge of hot brine, especially in the case of thermal desalination, the chemical additive and biocide in the discharge, the, the salinity increase, this is another uh, major issue, uh, the decrease in dissolved oxygen and toxicity because we are using during the process chlorine and other you know kind of chemicals. Uh, the, so the brine concern, so we have uh, uh, a lot of studies uh, trying to, uh, uh, to monitor the brine the distribution and how can we um, uh, control this, the temperature, especially the harmful agar blues, I mentioned it, not necessarily the cause of desalination plants, because uh, I think all the industries, uh, effluents in the sea, uh, contribute to this phenomenon because they uh, raise the temperature, they raise the number, the, the quantity of the nutrients uh, in the sea. So this is the best, um, the best environment for those algae to pr proliferate. Um, so chemicals, so the different chemicals we are using, the pretreatment, post-treatment, etc. And uh, you know, the, I, I will not go into detail the different kind of chemicals that we use in the processes. So the seawater intake, we need to take precautions. The impact on the population, you know, of the of the fish and the, the larvae, we need to avoid the areas where we have eggs. We have the area where, with the concentration of fish. We need to look at the, the, the right place to where to build our plant and our intake uh, intake uh, system. Uh, sometimes, you know, because of geological factors, we can have habitual intake. This is the best intake, but we cannot do it everywhere. For example, in Oman, we have only one plant in Sur, uh, the south of Oman, with habitual uh, um, uh, intake. And when I asked them, I think eight or 10 years, they never changed the membranes because of the good quality of the feed water. But as I said again, the habitual intake is not possible uh, every, everywhere. Uh, another problem that I can mention also, I uh, I, I had I had uh, uh, got uh, one research project about this is the land is the the, the end of life membranes because as you know we were talking about twenty thousand plants around the world the, there is an increased use of membranes everywhere with the time we will have a lot of you know membrane in the landfill so I propose to recycle those membranes for other applications of treated wastewater etc the, the carbon footprints if we compare RO with MED or uh, or MSF so we have somehow reduced CO2 footprints we are talking about 1.5 to 3.6 kilogram CO2 per, per cubic meter I think I, I I'm over time right I will try to to wrap up uh, you'll try to yeah but still okay. it's very interesting but do try to wrap up I will do, I will thank you so much. So uh, the cost is very complex. It's very complex to compare the cost of cubic meter in one area or another because it depends on so many factors. I will go directly, for example, in RO case, we need to take into consideration all the parameters you see here and the intake, the pretreatment, the RO, the energy recovery devices and the post-treatment. So, so many parameters depending on the configuration of the membrane, the type of the membrane, the type of uh, of intake of, of uh, pretreatment. So it's uh, impact on the final uh, final uh, uh, cost. And the, for example, the distillation data, this are data or the Global Water Intelligence website, you can, for example, there simulate and put uh, some characteristic of your plants and it can give you the cap capex, opex and the cost per cubic meter. But each company obviously has its own software to assess or to calculate the, the cost per cubic meter. There are some 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 perspective from uh, Nikolai Wojcikow about how the cost will will uh, will evolve in the next years. I think we're already talking about 0.3 dollar per cubic meter in the case of uh, Hassian uh, seawater plant in UAE. So we are really becoming very, very competitive in terms of the cost and in terms of energy uh, consumption. So the technology trends, we are going to witness more and more membrane technology uh, plants rather than thermal uh, plants. Uh, some top 10 technology disappointments. Sometimes we talk about graphene membranes. We can talk about uh, uh, new technology emerging in the market. But unfortunately, you know, between the laboratory, between the publication, even it is in, in nature, like the graphene membrane, which was published two years ago by the guys from the University of Manchester, but we don't see them in the market yet because this really takes years to upscale the technology and make it, you know, competitive in the, in the, in the market. So the best hope, hopefully in the upcoming years, would come from better membranes, would come from new approach of the for desalination, better energy recovery devices, uh, probably for uh, for what osmosis or maybe hybrid processes. For example, you have RO and you put MD or FO at the output to uh, you know to to get more more fresh water, etc. Uh, so conclusion. So uh, I will just uh, say the, the most important ones. So sea water desalination is vital and, rel and the reliance of many countries on this source is expected to grow fast. This growth will only be possible by continuing to improve the sustainability of related technologies. Uh, Sewer desalination is a good example. 
of the water energy food nexus. We have a lot of greenhouses powered by uh, you know solar, and uh, and uh, we are desalinating water to uh, uh, for 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 crops. Uh, uh, but you know um, we need to improve this, and we need to upscale this also uh, wider. Um, uh, the, by design incentive for local businesses, governments can attract domestic investments in man manufacturing. This is very important. Some probably my colleague mentioned this or, earlier. Uh, uh, for example, the Gulf countries are using this engine for almost 50 years and still they are importing every single component of the cell plants. So for example, when China closed the doors at the, at, the, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was really a problem because if they cl cl keep closing the doors or the borders, there will be a problem in some plants because they are you know, uh, importing everything. So we need to encourage uh, localization of the technology. We need to fabricate at least some parts of the of the plants. Uh, recommendation final slide. So we need to encourage PPP, public private partnership, uh, BOT or other um, uh, financial mechanism uh, to support the sustainability of decision schemes. Uh, there are some very successful projects in this regard, like Agadir plants in Morocco, which is the biggest uh, plant in the world in terms of using the plant or the essential water for agriculture. And also we need to localize not only technology, but also the knowledge. Sometimes we, we know we have now more and more desalination plant. We need to boost capacity building and training our engineers and our staff to you know to to make to uh, uh, to control or to better uh, control the the operation and maintenance of desalination plants, etc. So thank you so much. I'm sorry for for talking more than uh, uh, my expected time. I would be happy to respond to your uh, your question. And the final thing I just want to mention to you, I uh, I published a study on desalination as an alternative to alleviate water scarcity and climate change, uh, 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 and a climate change adaptation option in the MENA region. You can see the link here. You can uh, download the, the, the report, I, which was published in January. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, I will throw open the questions to the floor. But before that, I, I would like to uh, ask one question both to you Javed and also to Hiroshan. So if you could stop sharing, I've got two curiosity mm -hmm. questions and I would ask uh, Professor Bhattacharya to also say a word. The first curiosity question is as follows. Now, um, it looks as though some countries are putting a lot of waste into the oceans and you yourself were very clear about the impact it is going to have on the oceans. Now, waters are connected, just like we have air pollutions and carbon trading. Shouldn't countries which put brine into the ocean, you know, we do not know what impact it's going to have on the ecosystem. Uh, shouldn't they be made to pay some sort of a supranational tax? When is that going to come? Is there any need? Because, you know, if you throw something into the ocean, it, there could be a butterfly effect on the other side. So what do you think about this? I'd like to ask this to both of you. Then I have another question on downstream. Florence, uh, first you, Dr. Jawad. Uh, what do you think? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, true. This is a very, uh, the, the major concern about the essential technology uh, uh, around the world, even in some, uh, some uh, experts. Uh, warned about, for example, in Kuwait, which is inside the Gulf, with the increasing number of desalination plants and the circulation of the water into the Gulf, it take 100 years, you know, from the Indian Ocean to get into the Gulf and uh, circulate outside. So uh, this will increase the salinity of the water around, you know, the, the, the Kuwaiti coast. And obviously, as the salinity increase, uh, that means that, you know, the increasing the cost of desalination and it will be much more difficult. Uh, uh, but obviously, there are solutions in the market. We need, we need, we need to look at it in a holistic view. From one side, the government or local authority should, uh, you know, uh, improve the legislation, uh, the regulation. So the company should stick to some standards when it comes to uh, disposing the brine into the sea. So we need to have like a, a sort of pretreatment before disposing the brine. Uh, we need also to, to encourage them to use innovative technologies and see if some technologies can, for example, in some areas we are extracting salts and we are extracting minerals from the brine and it is used for industrial purposes. But this is in some cases in big companies where big production, so we can take advantage of this. Small plant is, is, is less uh, interesting. Uh, so there are solutions in the market. We need to encourage them. Even in some cases, we, we with the brine, we can cultivate some kind of microalgae and th those microalgae could be harvested, composted and could be used as fertilizers or as, you know, uh, 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 food for aquaponics, etc, etc. So, so, so you are talking about solutions, but there shouldn't be a tax on these 
countries which are polluting the sea more than others because of this technology you don't think that is i mean i'm just curiosity yeah. question because i know that things are going to improve what do you think you know is whose responsibility is this because we took a lot of time before we could uh, really come to terms that the developed countries have to pay more ta carbon tax now do you think a time is going to come when the countries which throw more brine waste into the ocean have to pay to others because they're going to be having an impact something do you think that's fair to ask do you think we should start doing it now i'm just a curiosity question sorry yeah, I mean, to have cut you short i was just curious no thank you i mean in principle it looks like a fair you know measure because obviously if we we apply the principle that we we use in europe uh, polluer payeur i mean uh, uh, i mean it's, it, yes it should it should work like that but obviously politically and uh, <laughs> practical terms is you know we cannot do it i mean because people say we have no water uh, sources resources so we are only rely on this ancient the biggest cities in the gulf uh, dubai uh, doha all the big cities are, are, are rely on this ancient 100% so you cannot tell them you know uh, it's difficult <laughs> yeah so i got it i got it but it's interesting